Thanks. Thanks for the intro, uh, Mark. Um, so anyway, I'm Ramsey Arpachi Dusso. The name is complicated. I, in grad school, I actually entered grad school as just Ramsey Arpachi, and then I uh, picked up another name uh, because my uh, soon-to-be wife at that time, whose name is Andrea Dusso, when I met her, uh, who's also a professor here now, uh, she said when we got decided to get married that we could either uh, keep our own name, so I could be Ramsey Arpachi and she could be Andrea Dusso, or we could combine our names, which is what we did, or we could not get married. <laughs> so, faced with a multiple choice question, I chose B. Uh, in any case, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, what I'll call grad school keys to success. Uh, it's mostly a research focused talk, so in some ways you think, well, maybe I'm talking only to people who stay here for a PhD, but I'd really like you to encourage all of you, as you're here, to take a new type of course, a graduate course. You're here with people, faculty, who spend their time and their careers doing research to try to get involved, at least in some way, to see what the research process uh, is like. Um, okay, so, and I think unlike all the previous talks that I heard here, this will have nothing to do with how to obtain more free food. So, so that has been covered, and I think it's actually probably the biggest key to grad school success, but I'm not covering that uh, in this talk today. Okay, and I revise this talk all the time, so this year it has 50% more success than before. <laughs> okay, this is a big transition that you're going through. You're undergrads, and presumably you are good at being undergrads, and undergraduate life actually is very simple. It, now, you talk to undergraduate students, they say it's very hard and they look stressed all the time, but really it's a very simple time of life. You go to class, you read a book, you take an exam, you basically tell them what they told you, and you do well. And I think most of you figured this out already, <laughs> right? And it's, so in some ways, you're very much a consumer of education. And so I will summarize this with a graphical representation of the linearity of undergraduate life. Okay, this is about as complex as the graphics get in my talk. So if you can follow that, you'll be okay. Now, graduate life is quite the opposite, or quite different at least. You're going to read papers in, say, 700-level classes. And unlike the textbooks, which you kind of accept as fact or truth, you have to start to criticize them. You have to say, is this a good paper? Is this a good idea? It's a much different skill set. You end up doing research projects, whether in class or maybe eventually with an advisor. And grades are not really the focus. It's actually not that hard to, I shouldn't say this, it's not that hard to do well in graduate classes grade-wise, but it's easy to do poorly from the bigger perspective, which is they're trying to show you something about how to do research. And the transition here is to being a producer, a creator of new knowledge. This is a hard thing. And there's a bad graph for that, too. I don't know why, I didn't, I didn't know what to draw there. Maybe I'll drop the graphs. The problem, of course, and the central problem in all of this is that research is hard. Research ideas, I like to think of ideas as being evaluated along two axes. axes. Novelty is the idea new, which it fundamentally has to be to advance the state of knowledge. And is it actually a good idea, right? Is it something that is worth using in the real world or maybe advances the state of the knowledge of our understanding of how computer systems work or some theoretical thing? So that's kind of the way to think about a new idea. And of course, what will happen is first is when you have a Ideas at first is maybe you'll have a new idea, but then it's actually just kind of a bad idea. And we could think about lots of different ones. I work in uh, file systems. A lot of our work is in file systems. So I could create a new idea, a file system, which uh, every uh, fifth operation uh, ignores what you did and trashes the disk completely. That's probably a new idea for a file system. Now, is it a good idea? Well, I, I don't know. Probably not. Um, now, in terms of this other axis, sometimes what will happen is you start to think about new ideas is you'll actually come up with a very good idea. And then you'll go and you'll be excited and you'll go and tell uh, some wise professor about your idea and they'll say that is a great idea and in fact it was invented in 1977 and here's the research paper. <laughs> so this is kind of a sad moment and if you go through it, don't be too sad, just keep trying. In fact what you'll find is over time is that the ideas you suggest, the, the year of the paper will become closer to the current time. And when finally it crosses over, <laughs> right? That's what you had to do, I mean. OK, so that's what you're going for there. So there's a nice quote I found uh, some years ago. And it's about why, why is it so hard to create anything? And this is really from a different realm entirely. It's from Ira Glass. And let, just, let me just read it to you. It's hard to make something that's interesting. Basically, anything that anyone makes, it's like a law of nature, a law of aerodynamics, that anything that's written or anything that's created wants to be mediocre. It's all tending toward mediocrity, the way that all the atoms are dissipating out toward the expanse of the universe. Everything wants to be mediocre, so what it takes to make anything that is more than mediocre is an extreme act of will. 
You just have to exert so much will into something for it to be good. It's really easy to do something average that doesn't stand out, that doesn't advance the state of the art. It's much harder. It takes that, it's the last 90% of something is, is taking it and pushing it into that new realm. So think about that. Anyway, so now we just have 12 keys to success. I think I'll just, these just go from 12 to 1 so you'll know where you are if you're getting tired of all the keys to success. I'll just start with number 12. First thing you should do, understand the point of graduate classes. It's different than undergrad classes. One of the goals is certainly to learn things that might help you with your research. If another is to learn about things that might interest you and maybe outside the area of your research. It's okay not to get the best grade in the class. A lot of you, this is very hard to let go of for some of you, right? I know in some other countries, for example, people know exactly what rank they were in the class. Oh, that person is two, I was three. You know, you kind of hate that person who's number two, <laughs> but you know how that is. You don't have that here anymore. You don't, it doesn't matter what grade you get because we're here to try to do Research. Now, it doesn't mean do poorly. It means do well enough, understand new things, put effort in, learn what you can, uh, and go from there. So what should you focus on? Well, one of the key skills you're going to focus on is you're going to focus on learn how to read research papers. This is a different skill than reading textbooks. Textbooks are generally easy to read and flow very naturally and simplify a lot of issues, and you accept as truth. Papers are not like that. They are advancing the state of the art, usually, especially the better papers. And you have to learn about how to read them. At first, it takes a long time because it's all new. But over time, you learn how to read more quickly. Uh, now, I overstay. I say you have to read a lot, but not too much. Because sometimes you can be a little overwhelmed. As you look into some area you're interested in, you'll find not that there's just that one paper you thought was cool, but then 10, but then 1,000. You have to limit yourself a little bit because otherwise you'll pretty soon you'll convince yourself there's no way I'm ever going to advance the state of the art. A lot of smart people have th thought about these things already. So be a little careful about that, but definitely you have to read a lot at first. It's all, classes also give you an opportunity to do a little bit of research, do a little bit of work to see what that work is like and see if you like it. And then importantly, they give you the ability to, in this whole space to start to analyze, to start to be a critical thinker. Now at first you're going to think that means for each paper, telling everybody how bad it is. And that's a phase of grad school, too. You'll be able to say what's bad about things. But remember, there's this other side of it, too, which is saying what's good about it. So be critical, but not a critic. Find both things that are bad and good about the papers that you read. OK, number 11. Remember, we're going from 12 to 1. Understand advising and advisors. Advisor-student relationship is really important to grad school. How to find the right advisor? Well. You know, if you can, if you have the ability to take some time and look around, that's a good idea. Read people's papers, talk to their students, talk to them, you know, get a, maybe do an independent study with somebody, get a sense of what this advisor is like, because this is a very important relationship that you're about to enter. And it's hard to have a lot of those relationships, though maybe if you make one, you know, you pair with somebody, it doesn't work, maybe you can find somebody else. But it's important to think about that a little bit. A good advisor, among other things, but most importantly, gives you advice, is there to try to help you get better at what you're doing to find research problems, to learn how to communicate them to others in written form, in, in oral form. Gives you lots of critique. This can be hard to accept at first for some people. Critique, sometimes people associate with means you're doing something wrong. It actually means that somebody's there to try to help you do something better. So you have to get used to that. It takes a little bit of adjustment. And advisors, I mean, not anyone that I know, but uh, they have strengths and weaknesses. Not in this department, I should say. Maybe some other departments. Uh, but more seriously, what that means is every advisor is good at some things and not so great at other things. So you have to kind of figure that out. You have to learn to understand what they're good at so you can get the most out of the advisor. So it's always something to think about. Uh, and this uh, nice quote here, advice is a dangerous gift even from the wise. So you should, you should always think about people's advice, but then decide and take the advice, listen to the advice, but don't follow it blindly. Think about it and then make a decision on your own. Uh, for example, my advisor uh, told me I was about five years into grad school, and he said, you're ready to graduate. And I told him, no, I'm not. And I wanted to stay one more year and do one more thing, and that turned out to be the thing that became actually the core of my dissertation. Um, so that was a slightly awkward conversation, but because <laughs> he's paying me, right? So <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to stay longer, and you're still going to pay me. And he's like, fine. <laughs> so be persuasive. OK, understand your role. What does that mean? Well. It's great for me to, sometimes you feel like education is there to kind of take care of you, and to the extent that we can, we do. But in the end, you're in charge of your own education. And that's being that person who's in charge of it is going to be the most effective thing, not waiting for someone else to help you out. Uh, so what does a good student do? Good students are organized. 
Uh, write down your thoughts. When you go to a meeting, you know, be ready to take notes. When the advisor or professor tells you something, write it down so at least it looks like you're going to remember it five minutes later, right? I mean, I don't know how many times I've, I've gone to a meeting unprepared before. Yes, that's happened. And then afterwards, you're like, oh, there was something that was interesting that was said in there, but I don't quite remember. It's kind of awkward to go back and ask. Now, in terms of thoughts, it's great to be organized and start, because if you're trying to do research, what you're trying to do is manage how you think about things and how you create new thoughts. In fact, one thing I did early on in grad school, this was over 20 years ago, now I'm sounding like an old person, is I started, uh, I created a, a text file, and I just, anytime I have a thought about what I'm thinking about in research, I write it down in there. I've been doing that for 20 years, and I go back and read through it occasionally, and once in a while I said, oh yeah, I forgot that idea, now it's a, I should come back to that. It's a great resource, and it's just something I have to manage myself, and you should think about something like that too. Make progress every day, not the day before you have a meeting with a research advisor. Work hard because that's probably the key to everything. A lot of times people get confused. They're 50% RA or whatever. And does that mean I work half time and then spend the rest of the time at all these SACM events that are really great? No, that probably doesn't mean that. It means you have to spend a lot of time on research, right? At other institutions around the world, the best in institutions, people are working really hard all the time and they're all really smart. So if you're in this competitive field where you're trying to get something of yours out there, <coughs> Doing it kind of half-baked isn't going to fly. So develop good habits. Um, what are habits? Those are those things you do when nobody is looking, right? And it's easy to have bad habits. It's hard to have good habits. So think about how to get into the right rhythm of your work and develop those habits because, because then after a while, then they become just things you do. You don't have to worry about it. And take ownership of what you do. Always take ownership. One way to think about professors is they're usually very busy, so the way you demand their time is through your dedication. If, you should, if the professor sees that you're trying to maybe work with or you want to start working with them, if they see you're really putting a lot into it, they're going to be more excited about it. If you look like you're not putting a lot into it, well, an advisor or potential advisor might not be as excited. Famous Edison quote, we often miss opportunity because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. Sad truth. Okay, know your peers. See all these people around you? They're worth knowing, most of them. All of them? Okay, most of them. Sometimes can learn more from your peers and your professors. Uh, sometimes maybe all the time, right? The people you sit around. So be social. Well, not too social. Be a little social, right? Get to know people. Be reliable when you're a project partner or an office mate. I had a person I was working on with a pro you know, on a project in grad school. We had a paper due Monday. It was Friday. I said, okay, it's going to be a long weekend. He's like, not for me. I'm going backpacking. And I said, we have a paper due Monday. He's like, sorry, I planned this months ago. So I didn't work with him anymore. <laughs> but it was a long weekend for me, as it turned out. So I was half right. Don't be like that. Be reliable. When you say you're going to do something, do it. Be active. There are people who form reading groups. People do all sorts of things to learn more about what they're doing. To be, to, to, you know, and it's, sometimes it's easier to talk with people who are at your same level, your peers, than it is to go ask a professor some question about a paper because you feel like, oh, I don't want to bother them. So use, use that to your advantage. And be around. You know, being around, not just working from home. From, you know, it's nice to work at home sometimes, and you should certainly do that. But also try to be around here as much as you can, because that's how you meet other people. As Woody Allen said, 80% of success is just being there. Be a continuous learner. You should always be looking to learn new things. It's one of the great advantages of being in a school environment. It's very hard to do this once you have a, a real job. Uh, because then you're getting paid to do certain things. It's hard to just learn other things. So learn conceptual things. Read papers. Learn practical things as need be. A new scripting language because it'll make you more effective or efficient in some regard. And I also say to read not just deeply in the area you're interested in, but read broadly. right? Um, so read from other domains because a lot of times you'll, uh, you'll read something from some other domain and you'll say, oh, that could be applied to something that we're doing. And then it can be useful. For example, for years, uh, we were doing some pr a project a, a few years back, and we were trying to develop a new what's called a file system checker, which basically goes through a disk and figures out oh, what's wrong with the file system, fixes it up, and, and then makes, your, makes it so you can use your file system, makes it so you can mount it. And a typical tool, if you're interested, it's called like FSCK, the file system checker. We were trying to do that in a new way, in a better way, because it turned out the current ways were error prone. And I always used to go to um, my colleagues 
uh, in databases, and I feel there's a very strong database group here, and I would go to the talks that their database people would give, and I would kind of make fun of them. I'm like, no matter what the talk is about, every talk ends with, or begins and ends with, you put some data in a database, you ran some queries against the database, and then here are the results. No matter what they were working on, that's what they were doing. And I thought this was ridiculous. And then we were working on this file system checking thing, and we went to one of these talks, and we said, you know, maybe we should build a file system checker by putting the metadata of the file system in a database, running some queries against it, and then producing some output. <laughs> and it turned out that worked really well. And we had this kind of cool paper that came out of it. And so I wouldn't have gotten that, we wouldn't have gotten that if we hadn't been thinking a little bit more broadly than just the types of things we're used to thinking about. Great quote from Steve Jobs in this uh, relatively unheard talk that he gave once. He said, if you're smart, what you do is make connections. And to make connections, you have to have inputs. Thus, try to avoid having the same exact inputs as everyone else. Gain new experiences and thus bring together things no one has brought together before. So he was arguing why, why did, he was asked basically, why did he take classes in calligraphy and all these other things that didn't seem that technical? And he said, look, if you put a bunch of smart people in a room and they all hear the same thing, they're all going to think the same thoughts more or less. So what should you do? Try to hear different things. So one way you can do that in the research world, which is huge, is read a little more broadly than others. Don't just learn, teach. I think you get, if you can teach things you know, you, can, you really understand it. It's actually the secret joy of being a professor is to get to explain things to people. So teach those around you when you can. Your advisor, certainly. I should talk about that when you meet with your advisor. At first, when you, you think advisors, well, they know a lot of stuff. They've been around. That's true. But we're always trying to do new things. And students are a way that we learn about things. Students go off and learn. Then they tell us what they're doing. So learn how to teach your advisor if you have one. Learn how to teach your peers. Of course, learn how to teach yourself. Um, so don't ask, do, do I understand this? Ask, can I explain this to somebody? Do I understand it well enough to explain it? And that usually requires a deeper level of understanding. So to teach is to learn twice. Nice quote about that. Have thick skin, number six. This one's really important because this is a typical conference that I submit papers and my students submit papers to. There's 200 submissions, maybe 25 get in, which means there's 175 people who worked really hard and their paper got rejected. So rejection is a common case for most people. So it demands a thick skin. And there's a bunch of ways to take those rejections. One is to say, and this is a very common, especially when you're new to grad school, if you submit a paper and the, the feedback comes back and you say, these idiots, they don't understand how great this paper is. <laughs> and I have absolutely had that feeling. And you will think that it's their fault your paper didn't get in. And this is a very, uh, well, let me say it's an immature way to take advice. Because what you're getting back is your community's feedback on your work. And if they have reasons to reject the paper, maybe you didn't write the paper in the way that made it so they didn't have that advice. If, maybe, if they didn't understand something, you could say, those idiots, they didn't understand what even the basic tenet of my paper. Two ways to look at that. One is that they're truly idiots. Two is that you didn't write it in a way that they could understand your great idea. Now, which is the more productive way to look at it? Um, well, it depends. If you're getting out of that area and you're done with research, maybe the idiot's way is a great way to go. But I would suggest the other way is probably better. Learn from, learn from the critique, because the critique is there to make you better. And people have spent time, usually very smart people on like program committees that decide whether these papers get in or not. They spend time doing the feedback. Learn from them. Don't dismiss them because they didn't give you the result that you wanted. Great quote from Beckett. Ever try, ever fail, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. Learn from your mistakes. It's OK to do the mistakes. It's just it's not OK not to learn from them. You should know your research community. Number five tip. Publication is a bit of a game. Is you have to learn how the process works. Um, so learn how to play it. What do papers in the field that you're interested in look like? Well, I remember what we would do when we were first writing papers. We would look at a paper that we liked and say, well, let's kind of copy the style of that paper, not the content. Don't copy the content. That's a very <laughs> bad thing to do. But the style, oh, how do they organize their idea? How did they make, you know, what types of questions do they ask when they're evaluating their idea? Look at good examples and try to learn from them. What problems does the community find interesting? As you scan and read a lot of research, try to get a flavor of what people find interesting to solve. The papers that get in are the ones that somebody thought was interesting. And what's needed? What kind of work is needed to convince the reader, the reviewer, that the paper is good enough? There's often, there is noise in the publication process, as we talked about. It's a bunch of people who've been given, like I was on the OSDI. It's a big systems conference program committee uh, re somewhat recently. And they give you a stack of 40 papers, and they say, read all these, and basically you reject, say, 35 of them. 
So it's a lot of work. You're reading dense technical papers. You're not going to do it perfectly, even if you are a dedicated reviewer like myself. Uh, maybe not myself. I'm an okay reviewer. But in any case, it's an imperfect process. It doesn't mean it's completely valueless. It means you can learn something and try to get it, figure out how to make how to make positive progress. Uh, though there's madness in the process, yet there's method in it. Communicate often. This is really important too. You, as technical people, you tend to think the important thing is the work, right? That's the important thing. That's why you got into it. In fact, I was almost dismissive myself when I was in, in school of, of classes outside of my technical profession because I said, well, those things are all just fluff or whatever. But it's really important to learn how to communicate. Well-written papers are certainly more likely to be accepted than poorly written papers, even if they were about the same idea. And by the way, when you, do, when you write things down, suddenly you'll realize there are holes in your arguments. So the act of writing actually helps you. You should communicate orally as well, as often as you can. Give talks, even short talks to your friends. Uh, you know, certainly professors and TAs get a lot of practice, and it's okay to be nervous at first. You know, the, what are people afraid of in the world? Two, death, one, public speaking, right? <laughs> Which is crazy. Um, I assume that's younger people. Maybe when you ask old people, they give a different answer. Uh, and it's, but the important thing is it's okay to be nervous at first. I remember my first week of grad school. I came, I was in a research group. They said, hey, read these 20 papers, and then next week present a summary of them uh, to our group, our research group. There's about 10 people. They're all older than I was. And I said, okay, I think I'm going to quit grad school. <laughs> I'm out of here. There's no way I'm standing up in front of these 10 people. I mean, how ridiculous is that? There's no way I'm standing in front of these 10 people and talking about this subject, which in fact, I know the people in the room know way more about it than I do. So I had that moment where I said, okay, take a deep breath, you know, figure out. I was petrified. And I got through it. And the more you do it, the more you give a talk, the more comfortable you get. And at some point you realize you don't get nervous at all. Or maybe you get a little nervous. I mean, even coming up here today, I start to, my heart start, starts pounding. I get excited, and then I settle down. So it's okay to be nervous. Just keep doing it. And get feedback on all these things, written things, uh, oral things, from the people who can give you feedback. Hamming, a uh, famous uh, researcher, invented Hamming codes, among other things, in his talk called You and Your Research, said you should spend at least as much time in the presentation of the work as you do in the work yourself. So you're spending half your time just writing about it and getting it out there to the world if you believe the idea is a good idea. It seems like a crazy amount, but that's what Hamming said. Okay, number three, develop taste. Taste in your research. This is, you have to figure out what kind of problems to solve. That's one of the hardest parts of research. What kind of problem should I solve? There are people who have been working on problems for a long time. You have to find, here's a new problem. This is interesting. I should work on it. And what's important about it? And also importantly, why are you going to do it well? Why are you going to do it better than others? You could say, well, you know what? I'm just smarter than everybody. That's one approach. And if that's true, that's really great. But it's great to have some other angle. What is your angle on your research that's going to make you better at it than other people would be in maybe solving the same problem or solving some new problem? A great quote from Eric Kandel, who's a biologist, actually, Nobel Prize winning biologist. And he's talking about, let me just read it to you. Maturation as a scientist involves many components, but a key for one a key one for me was the development of taste, much as it was in the enjoyment of art, music, food, or wine. One needs to learn what problems are important. I sensed myself developing taste, distinguishing what was interesting from what was not. And among the things that were interesting, I also learned what was doable. So what was important to him, he was studying how the brain worked. And he was trying to study, understand something about the brain. This is fascinating. The brain is obviously hugely complicated. It's billions of neurons, trillions of connections between those neurons. And he said, you know what, instead of studying the brain directly, I'll study a much smaller set of neurons in this sea slug. And he studied this small, he mapped out the circuitry of this sea slug in its entirety, and that was a much more tractable, tractable problem and led to his winning of the Nobel Prize. So very interesting to think about what can I do, what can I solve, how can I solve an important, make an important step towards some bigger goal that I'm trying to achieve. Another fun quote from Lee Smolin, who wrote a, a great book called The Trouble with Physics, if you're interested. Those who do good science do so because they choose problems that are suited to them. I remember when I was in grad school, I was working on something for a while, and I just wasn't getting anywhere. And after six months, uh, my advisor and I had this discussion, and he said, you know, maybe we should just declare success on this. And I said, yeah, that sounds good. So we declared success and just moved on to the next thing, which turned out to be a, a good decision. Sometimes you're working on something that just doesn't quite fit, so finding the, the better thing to work on is not a bad idea. Number two, be a self-starter. I already said you should be in charge of your education. There's a great New York Giants football motto. That's American football. 
It says on the wall of the locker room, don't complain, expect nothing, do something. I think it's a great words to live by. And in general, this great research isn't given to you. It's not like you're in this situation where your advisor says, just do these exact things and here's the great research that will result. Because that's not what you're trying to do. You're trying to come up with something new. So you make it happen. Don't sit back and wait for someone to tell you, now it's time to do research. Try, if you're interested in research, get involved as soon as you can. Um, another piece of advice my advisor gave me, I asked him actually on the first uh, day that I was there. I said, how should I, what, what are the keys to success? I kind of said, what's the short form of this talk? And he said, oh, here's a couple thoughts. People remember what you finish, not what you start. It's easy to be a person that starts lots of projects, but it's hard to finish them. So finish what you start if you can. And most of the time I did that, except that one case where I moved on to something else. And he said, it's sink or swim. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, you know, there's a lot of bright people around. So uh, you got to work hard to stand out. And I said, couldn't you have waited a few weeks before you told me that? <laughs> it's kind of rough advice, right? Sink or swim. Uh, he said, but you know, if you put work into it, you'll find that you might be able to swim. OK, I'll end with this one thought. It's called The Two Kinds of Gifts. It's one big long quote, so you have to indulge me. I like this quote a lot. It's from this book called The Art of Game Design, which doesn't seem like it's about the research process at all, but it's probably a, a more general point by Jesse Schell. And what he says is this. There are two kinds of gifts. First is there, there's the innate gift of a given skill. This is a minor gift. If you have this gift, such as skills doing math or playing the piano or writing code, for example, uh, it comes naturally to you. There are millions of people who, with minor gifts of all kinds who never do anything great with their gifted skills because they lack the major gift. The major gift is the love of the work. This might seem backward. How can the love of using a skill be more important than the skill itself? It is for this simple reason. If you have a major gift, you will do things with the skills you have and keep doing them. And your love of the work will shine through. And through practice, your skills will grow and become more powerful until your skills are as great or greater than someone who has only the minor gift. So only one way to find out if you have the major gift, start down the path and see if it, well, he says if he makes your heart sing, which is a little corny for me, but it's a great quote in general. So he just says, go try it. See if you're into it. If you're into something, then you, you find that you want to spend time doing it. If you're not into it, then you're saying, oh, I got to work. You know, maybe I'll go clean the kitchen. Maybe I'll go out to the Sackman's latest event. Maybe I'll spend some time doing something else. But if you're into what you're doing, you find that you want to spend time on it and that's how you actually succeed, is by putting in all of that time. OK, that's it. Uh, I give some references here uh, to other talks from Dave Patterson, who was my advisor and Mark Hill's advisor, actually. Uh, John Regeer at Utah gives a similar talk. Jim Carosa gives a similar talk. Look those up. But they all kind of say the same thing, uh, which is kind of the things I said here today. So thank you.